Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and this is the recommendations episode that we have been looking forward to. We have requested your recommendations, listeners, and we have received some from you. Not all of you sent in recommendations which I'm, I'm frankly disappointed by. But we have some, and we are excited to share them with you. All right, so our first recommendation is from a Noah. That is what it says in his text. It says, hello, Emily, this is a Noah. <laughs> I have a recommendation for the podcast. I have been greatly enjoying listening to Answers in Genesis. They are the creation comma science group headed by Ken Ham. I appreciate the comma because... Oh, no, it's Christian science that you have to be really careful about. Yeah. Having to <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> yeah. different. Uh, but the creation science group headed by Ken Ham. I specifically recommend a series they have been working on covering the history of the Native American nations. Oh, that would be really interesting. Every time that comes up in conversation, I'm like, wow, I know nothing about that. That would be really cool. It is very good, biblically founded and scientifically put forth. Uh, was Ken Ham the one who did the series about all the different animals? that, um, you know, the, the biology of them has these different aspects that work together in just such a way that if you had either of them evolving separately, the, the, the animal would die and we would not have those animals. I think it, it was It's that the kind of thing yeah. answers in Genesis it sounds like it may have do been that. Ken Ham. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. What uh, this Noah is talking about. <laughs> this Noah. <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to the one on the ark. Um, yeah. <laughs> is a uh, lecture series by Nathaniel T. Jeanson, who is a PhD in, I don't remember exactly how he puts it. It's some kind of really complex genetic molecular biology, throw computers in kind of degree. But <laughs> it is a fascinating, I have, his book is called Traced. Hmm. Human DNA's Big Surprise. And I'm only... About ninety pages in, uh, hmm. the, and and the presence of of humankind in the Americas. I haven't got to yet. I've kind of sneaked a peek because, like you, this looks to be fascinating. But I I did hear the lecture that I was talking about, and it um, it it set up a time scale for the original entrance of human beings into the American continent. Uh, which goes back a long way. And then a later entrance that gave us the people we generally think of as Native Americans. So there's, he's tracing using the echoes of DNA in, I believe, Y chromosomes, um, showing how people groups migrate. Hmm. Uh, and he spends mm. a good deal of time in Africa, in the Middle East, and in other places, as I say, I've only gotten any pages in. But it is fascinating. He's very... Uh, cautious and humble, and he says, this is the first word. There's more to learn. There's more to know. We're working with a very small sample sizes, but if things play out the way they look like, here's some things that are going to revolutionize how we look at the world uh, world history and the migration of um, linguistic groups. So if uh, world history, ancient history, and all of that DNA is your thing, this is this is a good book. And I don't think you have to have a degree in science to appreciate and understand most of it. Uh, I'm not a biologist, and occasionally I get thrown for a what? But most of it is very accessible. So yes, no, excellent recommendation. I really appreciate that spirit from an author that, you know, the proverb that says that the first person who speaks sounds right until somebody comes and asks some <laughs> questions. <laughs> it takes yes. some boldness to speak first, knowing yes. that. So great. Well, do you want to Very take cool. the next recommendation, Greg? Yeah, the next one I have is from someone who signs himself Joshua. And this is rather lengthy to the rest of all of us. Oh, this is multi-part, yeah. Um, oh, wow. This is the first time I've written into the podcast, but I really enjoyed listening to the Walls episodes. Those would be the ones on Nehemiah and thereabouts. And I had mm -hmm. some thoughts and recommendations I wanted to share. The concept that religion is so closely knit with the idea of a city is so true. Ancient civilizations and their cities would center their worship on ancestors that they deified. In archaeology, the mark that whatever city you have discovered had an established culture was based on three things. 
the presence of religion, money, and alcohol. That's funny. <laughs> so yeah. it makes sense, though. Oh, you know, it you've makes got a lot of sense. the time to cultivate grapes, grain, et <laughs> and grains. Yes, and then so s- Kentucky s- doesn't have an established culture in the dry counties. Is that what I'm understanding? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so yes, walls and cities do have a close tie to religion. Abraham looked for a city which had foundations, rules, laws, and a religion based upon the God, capital G, of that city, whose builder and maker is God, the per- person being worshipped in the city. Mm-hmm. My wife, whose name he gives, and I took our church's youth group on a mission to Salt Lake City this summer. If you want a close-to-home perfect example of how religion dictates the creation of cities and laws, look no further than our Mormon friends in Utah, Arizona, and Idaho. Everything is measured from the temple. Every law and code is based on the Book of Mormon. The courts are controlled by the church. It really is crazy how integrated Mormonism is into the culture they live in. Oh, can I interrupt and mm-hmm. comment? I so appreciate this because it brought to mind um, how in ancient Greece, you know, the, the Greek word namas, that we get taxonomy and the yeah. law of sorts of right. things. But it's... In ancient Greece, there's not a difference between law as in legislation and law as in custom or a way of life, right? Mm. That's the the word applies to both, but it's kind of almost more to the custom side because there's so much of that where the law of a of a city is so wound up in its culture and just the mm. way people lived. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, he he goes on. I also have a couple of recommendations. It seems like people haven't been answering too much, so I have a couple. Recommendation one, the song You Are Gold by the National Parks. My wife entered, Brian's nodding his head greatly here. I also went and listened to this song. It is a great, great. (laughs) it's a good song, but that band is also excellent. Like they're multi-times featured on my wife's and my driving playlist. (laughs) My wife introduced me to this band when we were dating, and this was the song that we danced to at our wedding reception before we left for the night. It seems to fit what the last episode of Walls was all about. I would also just to recommend the national parks in general. They have very good music. Agreed. Yep. Okay. Recommendation two, writing stories. My brother, name given, is a great storyteller. He used to tell me stories before we would go to bed. And I always thought that he was so amazing recently because of random sentences I would make up during spelling tests last year. (laughs) So many of our friends are writing books. This is this is a new approach, though. I began writing a book series. It's not that impressive right now, but it has been a fun hobby to do in my spare time. I do not know if people would read it, but it helps me to be creative and try something new. I love when people just write things for fun. Yeah. Um, it brings out very much the etymological meaning of amateur, one who mm. does for the mm. love. Mm-hmm. And as it turns out, the more you do, the uh, especially with writing, the the better you get. <laughs> um, yeah. There's a, a thing in copywriting, which is just like, if you want to be really good at copywriting, you have to prepare to suck a lot first. Um, <laughs> and, you know, that's true of everything, but that's yeah. my sort of expertise area. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, recommendation three. Um, homemade smoothies. Amen. Amen. Mm-hmm. I've recently started oh, yes. to make smoothies every morning for me and my wife. It's a great way to get some much needed vitamins into our diet. It's also fun to experiment with different fruits and vegetables and come up with new smoothie flavors. Okay, guys, favorite smoothie flavors? Strawberry. Yeah. Mm. Well, I always start with a banana base and then it's whatever frozen fruits I happen <laughs> to have. But you know what's fun is if you take some Greek yogurt and like make a pattern on the inside of your glass, it makes <laughs> it look really fancy. <laughs> I learned okay. that from YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Although I will say as well, uh, blackberry is very good. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, banana, strawberry, but I'm not above throwing in other kinds of berries yeah. on top of that. I like it purple. I always think it tastes better if it's purple. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he ends with saying, thank you for the co- podcast. I hope it continues to do well. And I look forward to the next episode. So that's cool. this one. Wow. Right. Well, Brian, you had a bunch of stuff to recommend afresh. So I'm excited to yes. hear some of this. Well, I just I have one thing in particular uh, this round, although I can say another thing. Um, 
I was recommended this book. This is a soft recommendation because I have not read it, but it has been recommended <laughs> to me, and I love the theory behind it. It's called Shop Class as Soul Craft. Oh, I've read this. Yes, I can hard recommend. Okay, yeah. <laughs> thank you for that. An inquiry into the value of work, and I I got recommended it, or someone recommended it to me when I was talking with them. They live in Mexico, and we were just talking about like how hard it is when you work either remotely or you most of your job is behind a screen at a desk. How it's like there's not a lot of tactile evidence of the work that you've actually accomplished mm -hmm. and the this book at least as one of its things uh talks about how something nece almost necessary for mental health for um just a sense of accomplishment is is doing things that involve the use of your hands and working on something that is physical mm -hmm. um whether it's you know this is, I don't think this is quite in the realm of the book, but whether it's like a sport where you're actually using your hands, hand-eye coordination, movement, muscle use, uh, or it's something like carpentry. Um, for me, I really enjoyed the process of building raised garden beds earlier this year, and it was like really cool to look out back and be like, I built those. Mm. They are out there, and they are getting use, and I can see the screw that went in and didn't go all the way in and broke. <laughs> like there's just all these little things. I'm like, I remember doing that. And like, there is a tangible physical thing at the end of my, I don't know, probably 12 hours total. If, if, it, if I had done it straight in a row work on these things and it's really cool. So that book just kind of, as, as I have been told, delves into that as a, a way that, people need that they're not getting in the primarily digital world that we've created for ourselves uh this primarily digital hellscape um so yeah that's that's that one and then uh before we started recording i was just thinking about what well, my about the stuff growing in the garden beds and one of the things we're growing right now is Brussels sprouts, which if you haven't tried Brussels sprouts in the past 25 years, you should definitely try them again because uh, there's a guy who I forget what year it was. I think it was in the 90s. He actually specially bred Brussels sprouts to favor the strains that didn't have a particular chemical that makes them very bitter. That's what mm. everyone had before 1990, whatever it was. Uh, so you should try them again, roast them in an oven with something that you like tasty wise, and it'll be good. But two summers ago, my wife and I, we were engaged at the time, went to a restaurant in the area that did roasted Brussels sprouts with elote toppings on it. And if you're unfamiliar with what elotes are, elotes is a Mexican side dish. It's a roasted corn on the cob covered in... The closest equivalent is sour cream. There's te it's technically a different thing in, in Mexican food. Uh, and then chili powder and cotija cheese, which is just like a crumbly cheese that sticks really well. And it's really tasty. So I, Brussels sprouts with that were really good. And that's the recommendation. Excellent. Very cool. I was just uh, looking up some notes that I saved from Shop Classes Soulcraft. Yeah. There were some really remarkable quotations from it. Um, and I can't find one. It's it's on the like Kindle notes, so I'm going through ah. my Goodreads to try and find it. Kindle. I wish I'd bought this book and read it on paper because it, it's ah. worth worth owning. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> it was like three dollars on Kindle, so uh, okay, that's fair. <laughs> um, but one of the really great parts of it was this quotation that says, I like to fix motorcycles more than I like to wire houses, even though I could make about twice as much money wiring houses. Both practices have internal goods that engage my attention, but fixing bikes is more meaningful because not only the fixing, but also the riding of motorcycles answers to certain intuitions I have about human excellence. People who ride motorcycles have gotten something right, and I want to put myself in the service of it. This thing that we do, this kingly sport that is like war made beautiful. <laughs> 
Yes. I like that. <laughs> I like it a lot. The, the quotation that I'm looking for is something about how understanding the world requires us to live in it. And it Ooh, always yeah. reminds me of something my pastor said once about how love is essential to knowledge when we're talking about God. If we, we are never going to understand God, you know, exhaustively, certainly not ever. Um, but truly, without submitting to him, and loving him without our hearts being open to him, there's there's a quality of knowledge that is yeah. totally lost to us if we don't take him on his own terms. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Hard hard recommend on that book. And the Brussels sprouts sound incredible. Oh yes. Right. I, uh, I really I really want to get the book and read it just because I mean you're the second person who who knows what it is and can recommend it. So that's already. Very high praise. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll give us our next listener reco. This is from Jake. Good morning, all. Good morning, Jake. I have been enjoying your podcast discussions for some time. Thank you for the thought you put into them and the incre- intriguing subjects you cover. They brought me to look deeper into various books of the Bible as I read through them, as I read through them. I am grateful to my friend Jordan for showing me your podcast. I think Greg had him as, as a student years back at Cornerstone. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Jake. That's nice. Secondly, I was curious of y'all's thoughts on the Chosen series. I have heard you mention it briefly in past episodes. Oh, I don't remember that. So you must be very it, attentive. You know, it, it came up briefly, very briefly. Um, okay. I'm curious as to what your scripture based opinion is regarding personifying mm-hmm. the life and times of Christ. Also interested in your thoughts on the accuracy of it, if you've seen much of it. I've enjoyed it and will take no offense regardless of your thoughts. Thank you, Jake. We appreciate that. (laughs) Yes, Jake. Thank you. Similar to your podcast, this series has inspired me to look deeper and spend more time in the scriptures myself. Looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Have a great day. Cool. Which of you has watched enough of it to go first? That would be me. I (laughs) have seen clips. That is the most I have seen of it. I binged on clips this morning so that we I could at least say something here. Yeah. Um, do you, does one say, of you want to go first? I'll I'll go first because my opinion is the most quickly given and discarded um, <laughs> because I have not watched any of it. Um, I have purposely avoided watching it um, because I don't watch things that make an image of Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, I know there's a lot of there's some diversity of opinion on that particular point. That's kind of where I fall. I don't want to look at somebody else's face and say that it's Mm -hmm. the face of my savior. Um, Mm. I'm, it's just, it feels icky. (laughs) I I think the word you're looking for is idolatrous, but, uh, I I was was trying to make it soft. (laughs) (laughs) Brian, what do you think? Um, my issues with it more come down to, license Mm. um particularly the creative kind (laughs) um where you know at the end of one of the gospels and i i'm embarrassed to say i can't remember which one i think it's john it's john Uh, it is yeah it says you know if (laughs) everything that christ had done in since his resurrection were to be written down it I, i i imagine it would fill all the books in the world yeah and more I don't think we have the license to make that up. (laughs) Um, Beyond that, you know, Emily's already touched on the uh, second commandment issue or second commandment adjacent issue anyway. And I do still find myself in agreement with that. Um, It's yeah. I I don't like the idea of, of saying like, Hey, here's this, you know, in this case, I think I think he is a Caucasian male. Uh, this is this is the Jewish savior that we worship. Mm-hmm. Totally, that's him. Um, but like we we do understand. Sorry, can I interrupt and be devil's advocate? You may. You can be the devil's um, advocate. Yeah, we understand symbolism, right? We understand acting. So mm-hmm. why wouldn't it be fine to say, well, this person is representing or portraying Christ? Why would that be a problem? See, I'm throwing this to you so that I don't have to do it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> you mean, why would it be wrong to make a representation of a divine person? Yeah, that one. But he's also human, fully human, right? Yeah. True man. True man. I, I do have to admit, I am still somewhat on the crux of this argument in my head. <laughs> um, 
perhaps not the best person to parse out all of the details here. You're a great person to have to work through it out loud, though. Sorry, yeah. I've been thinking a lot about how like art requires you to see the wrestling and not just skip to the end. So I'm going to. That's gonna... a very good point. But yeah. Um, yeah. So my, my sympathies very much lie with the reformed view of the second commandment. Uh, that's what I've held to for at least the past probably probably seven, eight years, something along those lines, almost a decade. Um, and. I, I do see this. I am I'm somewhat sympathetic to certain Lutheran arguments about it, mm. um, more so than any Catholic arguments, obviously, because they break <laughs> their own rules. Um, so, would the Lutheran like, argument be that God made an image of Himself in incarnation of Jesus? That is at least the Lutheran argument I'm aware of and familiar with. Yes, um, I'm, I'm sure there's more in depth ones, but that, that's that's the one I've sort of mainly I- encountered. And uh, the other sort of aspect is that because because Jesus is veiled in human flesh, uh, well, sorry, Jesus is human flesh as well. Since the Son is veiled in human flesh, that therefore it's not improper to consider what the human form of the hypostatic union would look like, and that you know, if, hypothetically speaking, if you had a camera and went back and took a picture of it, that would be a picture of, of Jesus that isn't idolatrous because it represents reality, things like that. So I'm not entirely convinced that that makes it licit, but yeah, it it is still something that uh, there's just like a sort of niggling doubt in the back of my head because we also looked at church history and see that icons of Christ are incredibly common throughout the third through, you know, third century up to the Reformation, basically. So I don't know. That's a long way to go to, I don't know. But (laughs) um, I think, I think for me as well, coming back to the Chosen series is I don't entirely trust a show to accurately depict the work and person and character of Christ when the creators and the writers are, to my knowledge, and I could be wrong on this because I haven't cared about the show since it started, but <laughs> I, I, what I have heard and what I'm under the impression of is that most of the writers and the creators are Latter-day Saints. Mm. So I don't think that I trust a Mormon to accurately portray Christ in any sense, whether visual or uh, literal, literary. Like so, character-wise, do, do they really know what Jesus is like? Yeah, there, there's that, and I've I've also heard, like I've seen things where you know people have. Oh, what was the what was the one? Everyone got mad about it online. Oh, it was like I think it's the scene where. Um, Jesus is being confronted by the by the high priest and his men before the crucifixion. And his line is to say, like his rebuttal to one of the things that they bring against like you're breaking the law of, of Moses and of God, is to say, I am the law. And people sort of got mad at that. I shouldn't say sort of. They got mad at that. <laughs> and while I again it comes down to lic- license and licensure. Do we have the right to put words into Christ's mouth that we are not given by the Holy Scriptures, Um, except in the sense of very loosely expounding upon them in sermon form, for instance? I don't think so. But at the same time, it's like that, that statement, it strikes me weird the first time I heard it, but I don't think it's entirely wrong either. It's one of those things like Presbyterians are known for saying we distinguish. <laughs> um, I think if you make the right distinctions, that is not a wrong statement to put into Christ's mouth, as it were. But I, again, wonder at the proper license of doing so. So that's, I think that those three points kind of sum up my reaction to the show. And then the fourth point is just, 
eh. <laughs> <laughs> it's another show. It's another vaguely, you know, uh, loosely of evangelical thing that everyone has come to enjoy. And it's like, that's great. So in other words, you're a hipster. I well, yes, I am, <laughs> uh, but I'm also reformed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the worst um, kind of hipster. <laughs> the worst kind of hipster. I except I don't smoke cigars. So, oh. um, yeah, the chosen. The chosen is just one of those things. that's very odd, and I, I think it comes from like I think the popularity comes from a good place because people are like, I want to, I want to have more of Jesus doing things or no more of the apostles doing things. At least I, 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 that's my best construction on it. That's me giving the, the most benefit of the doubt possible. I also just, again, it's the Presbyterian drive of this isn't scripture. This isn't like scripture didn't tell us these things about Jesus, about his life, his ministry, about things the apostles did that aren't contained in Acts. And when you are talking about Bible history in particular, it it just verges on how much of this is just you making up fun stuff as opposed to trying to teach true things. Something that's pretty important to get right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. And and that's not to say there's no fun things in, in scripture that are true. But um it just again, it just comes down. It rubs me the wrong way in a lot of different ways. All right, Greg. First of all, I agree with everything you both said, and I would take it further. But you've taken it far enough, and then I, I think we can leave it there. Um, the Reformed Presbyterian confessions are pretty clear that we should not make images of the divine person who is the Son of God. The, the camera uh, argument comes up. If there had been camera, if it's not an it's not an accident. There were no cameras. God planned it that way. There were sculptors and artists who could have left us pictures of Jesus, and God didn't arrange for that. Um, God wants us to walk by faith and by His Word, not by images and by sight. And when you do, and Emily, something you said, if if you keep seeing a face and keep associating it with a name and an identity, that can stick more than you want it to. I actually still, like, this is one of those things. It's like, when I was very, very young, I have mm. a distinct memory of being six or seven years old. I didn't see a face, but I remember thinking of God as a, or actually of Jesus as a particular looking bearded adult yeah. male. Yeah. And it's still there in my head. Like every <laughs> time I think of him, I think of that face and I'm like, that isn't probably right. <laughs> no, I, my parents, probably my mother hung a picture of Jesus in my room when I was small. And if you say Jesus and I let my mind go visual, that's what I go back to. And it's not, it's the Renaissance olive skin gone. <laughs> Jesus, I much prefer the surfer dude Jesus if we're going to. <laughs> and 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 in terms of the actor they picked, I will admit, I, I watched a lot of clips this morning. And <laughs> um, just to see what they were doing. And I thought they picked a good actor for mm -hmm. what they were trying to do. <laughs> They're part, they have an idea of who Jesus is, and it's sort of close to maybe the Jesus of Scripture. But of course, they can't portray the incarnate Son of God because, well, our, our idea of Jesus is he's like this, and he would say this, and he would react like this. That's, you're not God. You're not the Holy Spirit. You don't, your idea of what Jesus would do, although it might be interesting and might be a healthy correction to what other people have thought Jesus mm -hmm. would do, mm -hmm. uh, still can, can lead astray. I appreciated it that the Jesus they portrayed was very human. Sense of humor, <laughs> interacted with people both um, verbally and physically. It, it was very, it was yards away, from, yards, <laughs> layers away actually from the the stained glass Jesus of the uh, uh, of the uh, icons of the Eastern Church. Um, but yes, and then everything, Brian, that you said. But that very success that it has there makes you like this guy 
and easily lets you confuse him with the real Jesus. And then there's the problem. If God had wanted to give us a movie, he could have rearranged mm -hmm. history so that movies were a thing when his son was on earth. Yeah, he deliberately funny. didn't do that. The, the thing about acting or even reading aloud is that it forces you to have an interpretation, right? Mm -hmm. But God gave us a word which requires interpretation, which gives gives us ambiguity, which is pretty cool, right? So that mm -hmm. people can read the same story and have different takes on what's going on. And, you know, God planned for that. Yeah. yeah. So you don't want to nail yourself down to one, one reading, as it were. Which, which also is very interesting um, because... For instance, I, the only example I can think of are Catholic ones because they're very prolific at right at uh, making icons. Mm -hmm. um, but different Catholic icons from varying ethnic groups display Christ as their ethnic mm -hmm. group, mm. which is very interesting. And I don't know that there is a good reason for that. If I were to put the best faith construction on it, it would probably be something along the lines of, well, you know, Jesus took on the sins of every man. So every man has, you know, different ethnicities and all that kind of stuff. But it's still, I don't know, it's still weird. Anyway, I, that's just a tangent. Yeah. I think I interrupted you, Greg. Sorry. Um, no, although... Um I was trying to find the lyrics to some children see him lily white, the baby Jesus born this night. Some children see him almond eyes, this savior whom we kneel beside. Some children see him dark as they, sweet Mary's son to whom we pray. Some children see him bronze and brown, the Lord of heaven to earth come down. It, it, it is, it's one thing for a child to automatically think that Jesus looks like himself because no one's told him otherwise. <laughs> it's another thing when you start rewriting the history of the Gospels in order to accommodate. And um, there, there's a danger, I think, in this series of that. It's it's not as great, perhaps, as in some series, but it's still there. Yeah. Where we start rewriting the words of scripture, adding words to fill out your interpretation of what's going on here, what Jesus is feeling, what the crowd's feeling. His explanation, their, their presentation of John 3, the conversation with, with Nicodemus, was in some respects quite good, but they added a lot and they subtracted some things. Uh, and it does change things. And it, it still leaves you feeling that the person you're talking to is less than the Son of God. A wise, kind man, yes. And I think there's just that little that little um, hole that's being left that will get bigger and bigger with time. This this actor, whatever his good intentions may be, is not Jesus Christ. And so I'm, I think my warning to people listening is, is there skill? Is there talent? Is there imagination? Is there an interesting perspective? Yeah, you can give them all that. But at bottom, we're adding to Scripture and we're, we're representing Christ not only visually, but also by adding words that are not in Scripture, and by taking away who all of who he claims to be in the whole context of the Gospels. So, Yeah, uh, I think uh, I appreciate how Jake said it encouraged him to read more closely. Yes, indeed. So if you're going to watch, watch yeah. like Jake, <laughs> compare <laughs> yeah. it to Scripture, watch with discernment. Well, uh that that's another thing too is like my my wife and I do our morning devotions and right now we're in acts and it's insane how many things you don't remember mm -hmm. when you're just recalling the story mm -hmm. you know we just read in acts today about how the church um behaved shortly after after pentecost where they they all held all things in common. And a couple of the things that I can't remember the second thing, I'll look it up in a second. But the, the first thing that I noticed for the first time was it said, there is none among them who is needy. Mm -hmm. And I remembered, like, as, as I read that, I was like, oh, one of the things in the Mosaic Law said, if you do these things, 
you will have no poor among you. Mm, yes. And I went, wow, I never noticed that before. I never made that connection before. That's uh, amazing. And I was like, wow, that is what a, what an incredible, like it, it's just, mm-hmm. it's just so brief, brief touch, yeah. barely, mm-hmm. barely dwells on it ever again. And you're like, wow, that is incredible. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, we have more recommendations. I didn't mean to, um, put all of Gwen's together. Dear Gwen has sent us an abundance of wonderful recommendations. Thank um, you, Gwen. Yes, thank you, Gwen. Thank Gwen. I'm I'm going to do a shout out to Gwen. She has been <laughs> one of our most faithful supporters and listeners. Uh, she was actually the one when we started this years and years and eons ago. Um, <laughs> she reached out to us and said, um hi, can I give you money? <laughs> and we were like, uh, we hadn't considered the possibility that anyone would want to give us money. Uh, let us make a way for that to happen. Um, so big thank you to Gwen for all of your support. Um, and not just financial support, but faithful listening and encouragement yes. to us. You are mm-hmm. a blessing. So, um, Greg, would you read one of Gwen's emails for us? Uh, I have this one open in front of me. I'm sorry that you aren't getting recos. I think that maybe people don't think their ordinary lives are noteworthy, but they are because it's the ordinary thing. It's the ordinary that keeps things going. Mm-hmm. That being said, the things that I like to do are one quilt. I love making quilts. I enjoy stretching my creative side and I can make something that others can actually use. Two, Reading, I never was a great reader growing up. There were too many things to do outside. As I've gotten older, I really discovered reading and love it. I joined a couple book clubs and have been challenged to read a wide variety of books. It's been great. Three, walking. On Fridays, a group of ladies and I walk the trails at a local park. There are three ponds there, and this year we've been keeping track of three Canadian geese families from nesting to almost grown (laughs) kids. That's so fun. Yeah. Spending time with grandkids. For the last five summers, my now 17-year-old granddaughter has spent part of her summer here. She lives in Houston, and I live in Kansas. Three years ago, her younger brother started coming. They don't come together, but each gets a turn. The boy loves boy things. He goes to church camp with my church. A friend of his got a new BB gun for his birthday, so of course they enjoy tiger practice. The girl loves to go to museums and our awesome library. We basically just hang out together. Oh, and they get to visit cousins while they're here. So that's an ordinary life of a retired widow in Kansas. One last thing, I'm leaving next week to go to Scotland for two weeks. This was some time ago, so she's probably back. I always wanted to go there, but was too chicken this year. I took a deep (laughs) breath and made plans. I am so looking forward to it. Scotland's wonderful. Excellent. Thank you, Gwen. Those were wonderful recommendations. Mm -hmm. Um, I've always wanted to try quilting. Never done it. Um, I can absolutely second walking. Walking is a wonderful pastime. Yes. And reading. None of us ever reads, oh, though. No. Yeah, no, we don't no, like no, books no. here. Yeah. Books? Uh, as, there's no as pictures. I look back at my bookshelf. How are we supposed to no read? Uh, it's for spending time with grandkids. Well, none of us. Can. I'm waiting here. <laughs> I'm closer than you two are, but not yet. Mm-hmm. Still working on getting some weddings going in the next couple of years. Okay. Well, thank I you, Gwen. Say- Visiting yeah. cousins is amazing, though. So I have like 40 cousins on my mom's side. Mm. And I tell wow. you what, it was a little bit of culture shock the first time I sat down to Thanksgiving dinner with David's family and we all like had a place setting. That was wild. Because <laughs> <laughs> with 40 cousins running around, it's a buffet, it's paper plates, you sit wherever you can find a place. <laughs> Somebody sitting on top of the Victrola. <laughs> yeah, that's hardly an exaggeration. Yeah. Well, I have amazing. Gwen's... Uh, Gwen's other recommendation here, oh. and it is Silas Marner, yes. which I've never read. I just, I. I just finished it for the second time, and I love it more this time. I've appreciated all the recommendations that you've made and I'm trying to think of some more. I love working in my garden and watching the birds mm-hmm. that fly past my window in a hurry to make it to the tree. I love walking at the pond. There are three families of Canadian geese living there. And though the parents hit at us, they still let us watch them. <laughs> though there are a lot of troubles in the world, I can't help enjoying this little spot that God has placed me. And thank you again. So on. So again, thank you, Quinn Silas mm-hmm. Marner. Mm-hmm. 
have to see Quite if wholesome. Kate's read it. Yeah, I've read an abridged version in high school mm-hmm. from my from my world literature class, which was not Greg's world literature class, sadly. <laughs> but it was good, and I read an ab- abridged version of Silas Marner, and it was fun. I actually have a a good friend who who uh, a couple of good friends who have named their son after Silas Marner. Nice. It's funny because um, that name is very very similar to a, f- a friends of mine who I will not I will not name, but same first name. Very similar last name. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> you're recommending my friend? <laughs> what? I don't understand. I mean, he's a cool guy. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you're not sure you would recommend him? <laughs> um, yeah, I I do like the um, Steve Martin movie remake of Silas Marner. <laughs> really? Steve Martin? Yeah, it's actually quite poignant. He's, it's, he's a good actor in it. Hmm. It's called a simple twist of fate. Okay, I I know that the uh, the other one that I love, and I I don't know why I always mix up three books in American literature from different eras, which is um, I think Silas Marner is American, isn't it? No, it's George no, Eliot. I'm sorry. English. My apologies. I'm so sorry, Mr. Eliot. Um, <laughs> It's a lady, but <laughs> jeez, I am batting a thousand right now. Um, I mix up. That one by name, and for some reason, um, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, mm. and mm. the one about the guy who sleeps a long time. Rip, oh, Van, Rip Winkle? Van Winkle. Rip Van Winkle. I have no idea why these three are connected in my <laughs> mind. There's there's no rhyme or reason to it. I must have just like seen their name, like the titles, in a very short period of time in my uh, the, well, teenage they're all years. Names, right? They're all men's names. That's true, I suppose. Yeah. But, I always but get still. Iron Maiden and Flogging Molly mixed up for the same reason. They're just in the same drawer in my in my mind. At least those are those are both bands, aren't they? They are. They're not at all similar musically. Yeah, but they're both bands. I mean, like yeah, and all of those are stories, you know. That's fair. It's, okay, fine. Yeah. fine. <laughs> all right. Uh, we, oh, we do have one more recommendation from Alex. Yes, he recommends a book. And I have the Amazon uh, description in front of me. The book is Created for Work, Practical Insights for Young Men. The author is Bob Schultz. And the picture on the cover has a um, maybe pre teen boy pushing a wheelbarrow full of leaves past a pile of leaves, looking happy that he's working. So Created for (laughs) Work, Practical Insights for Young Men. From what I remember, and Alex had mentioned this to me in person as well. It's what it sounds like. It's uh, an introduction to the importance of work in the life of men, particularly young men, and how important it is to develop a work ethic, understand the theology behind it, and how this is service to God. Yeah. And the rest of it, it sells for 1993 on Amazon. You can get it used much cheaper. <laughs> so, Alex, this is, this is worth some time if you, if you want to think about these things. This, this goes with, it sounds like the book you were talking about earlier. Shop classes, Soulcraft. Yeah. Um, cool. Um, so I presume the Bob Schultz would be a Christian. I would have a Christian. Okay. Shop classes. Well, the word is not. created. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, Here's, created for work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, modern culture seems addicted to ease and entertainment. It's produced a generation of educated yet often dishonest unproductive and weak-willed men. God desires higher standards for his people. He's looking for young men who do not shy away from hard work, who are not afraid to get their hands dirty, who can follow directions, think creatively, respect authority, and happily complete their duties in a timely manner. These are the ones he's training up to be future fathers, teachers, and leaders, and so on. So, yeah. Mm. Good stuff. Yeah. I always get a... It's not like a kick. It's always a comfort to think on... God giving Adam a job before the fall. Mm-hmm. Like, here, Adam, here is a garden. Work in it. And it's like, you know, it's They didn't sometimes... call it the covenant of works for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's confusing. <laughs> it's exactly confusing to my point. Um it's funny though. <laughs> but um the you know, the the thorns and thistles of work came after the fall, of course. And it's too easy mm-hmm. to confuse the thorns and thistles with the work itself. It's mm-hmm. Like, shouldn't life, peace, rest in Christ be a vacation? 
and it's it's not. <laughs> that's what you do on your vacation, I should think. That's true. I haven't found myself working more on vacation, <laughs> but things I actually enjoy. Hmm. But not always. Yeah. Well, well, that, that is, seems to be it. That's what we have for today. Mm -hmm. so Excellent. We've had a whole re episode of recommendations, so I don't think we need to have any more recommendations. Have any more. <laughs> so we'll just see you next time for our <laughs> final episode for this particular arc. We've already named the series books, so I don't know what we're going to name the next thing that we do but there will be a next thing um we're planning to begin releasing our next series in january um it's gonna look a little different uh greg how much did you want to say about this right now absolutely nothing absolutely nothing all right teaser see you mm. later <laughs> thank you so much for listening we'd still love to hear from Intrigue. you if you want to send us an email with your recommendations or just an email uh you can reach us at halting towards zion at gmail.com and you can catch us on your favorite podcast catcher. Thank you so much. Have a good night.